This is Paranormal Skeptic Academy, using critical thinking and scientific reasoning to analyze your favorite ghost hunting shows. You will never look at them the same again. You have been warned. I'm back for another edition of Paranormal Skeptic Academy. After three episodes of primers, I'm finally going to critique an episode of Paranormal State. I will finally be using the techniques and information presented in those first three episodes. So let's jump right into it and discuss Paranormal State, Six Sense. This is Paranormal Skeptic Academy. So what do dead people look like? Sometimes they look bloody, sometimes they don't. Why do you think they come around you? I have no idea, but I think they're after me. I want to help them, and if this doesn't work, I don't know what else to do. You guys have the power to protect them. Amen. There's three of them. They come at nighttime. They are angry that we're here. We kick off the series premiere with a nail-biting episode full of evil spirits, demons, and dead bodies. We open to see Ryan at Penn State giving his team a briefing on the case. This particular case involves a six-year-old boy named Matthew Seagum, who lives with his mother and father in Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania, which is two and a half hours southeast of Penn State, just outside of Pittsburgh. We are briefly introduced to the team, but Adam Bly, who is a psychologist of the team, holds a BS in earth science, an MS in psychology, and is a PhD candidate for adult clinical psychology, all from Penn State University. He is the only one besides Ryan to actually speak. Adam is a devout Catholic and hosts a website called Religious Demonology, a web resource about demons from a Roman Catholic demonologist perspective. I think that's kind of a niche topic. He briefs Ryan about the boy and his paranormal experiences. So, Adam, why don't you go over really quickly some of the psychological stuff? Sure. One of the things that Matthew's reporting is a voice is telling him to do bad things to his mom, to jump off the roof, to do other violent acts. We need to be cautious about how much of this he's kind of like weaving a fantasy to get some attention. We need to look at whether this stuff is just being made up or it's overactive imagination and kind of lack of education. The bottom line is that this family needs help. They've been to counselors and doctors, and nobody can figure out what's wrong. They are desperate. Whether it's paranormal or not, they're asking for our help. We need to go in there. Now I wonder if they'll talk with any of those doctors or counselors that treated Matthew. At 1.18 p.m., the team arrives at the home of Matthew, and Ryan sits down for a heart-to-heart with the boy's mother. On the walls in the room they are sitting in hang pictures of Jesus and crucifixes, given the opinion that they are a devout religious family probably Catholic, but it's not mentioned in the episode. While Ryan is speaking with the mother, Adam, the psychologist slash demonologist, speaks with Matthew outside in the yard. Matthew explains when his experiences started to occur. How long has all this been going on? For quite a while. Are there any more now than there used to be? Not too many more of them are around. But they may start to be coming back again soon. Did any of them know that we were coming today? No. I never told anyone. Mm-hmm. Especially those black ones. Those ones are the problem. Why are they a problem? Because somehow I know they're dangerous. Why do you think they come around you? I have no idea. But I think they're after me. They may be. As is typical with these ghost hunting shows, After the initial interviews with the family, the team goes into detective mode and researches the area for any tragic events. What are the chances they're going to find one? Ryan digs deeper into the family dynamic and uncovers that the mother and father are having marital problems and are sleeping in separate beds. I wonder if this can have an effect on the psychological well-being of a six-year-old. Good thing they have a psychologist to look into this, and not to mention those doctors and counselors that treated the boy before. Adam is taking pictures of Matthew playing with guns in his room, and Matthew seems obsessed with the dead and seeing photos of himself looking like he's dead. After minutes of interviews, they get enough information from the family to focus their attention on one particular spirit, 
and that is the spirit of a man named Timmy, who died about six months after the Seagum family moved into their home. I did some quick online research to uncover that Timmy's death was an actual event. Timothy Eugene Shirey was 39 when he died. His skeletal remains were found on April 15, 2003. He went missing in August 2002 after his foster mother was put into a nursing home. A woman out for a walk discovered his remains in a recently cleared wooded area. Next to his body, they found a 22 caliber rifle. The Westmoreland County Coroner Ken Baca determined that Timothy died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. I was able to find this out within seconds. But I wonder what our lovable bunch of ghost hunters were able to find out. They pretty much found the exact same thing, but we get our first hint of deception. There are two things of note. One, when Ryan is making phone calls, he claims he is from Penn State University. Although this is a minor issue, it could mean the difference of someone actually talking to you. People will be more willing to talk with you if you're from a university than if you're a member of a student paranormal society. Two, in the episode, the team speaks with a James Testa, who claims to have found the body of Timothy. But as I just mentioned, and what I pulled from the actual news story, is that Timothy was found by a woman out for a walk. Now let's follow the bouncing ball of logic as Ryan and his crew determine that Matthew has psychic powers. Let me lay it out to you like this. 1. A man named Timmy killed himself a few months before the family moved into said man's house. 2. The family knew about Timmy's death, but kept it from their son Matthew. 3. Matthew starts to see a ghost of a man named Timmy. 4. Therefore, Matthew is psychic. Case closed. Give the boy an application and take him on your next ghost hunting adventure. We have a real life psychic, and one that could be trained to harness his powers for good, if it were only that simple. Let's examine these one by one. 1. Like most logic sequences, the first statement is usually a true one, and this one is no different. A man named Timmy really did die a few months before the family moved into his house. 2. We are followed by another quasi-true statement. I don't have a reason to doubt that the parents kept this from Matthew, but who's to say he didn't overhear them speaking about it, or heard it from a neighbor or friends? Unless they kept this kid in a soundproofed room 24-7, he could have heard about the death of Timothy, especially since they are living in his old house. 3. Here is where the logic gets a little tricky. Is Matthew seeing an actual ghost, or is he making it up because his parents are fighting and are causing him stress? If only there was a medical professional who could examine him. 4. This is a huge leap to conclude Matthew is psychic, but don't worry, our team has a foolproof way of testing his abilities. Ryan is not yet 100% convinced of Matthew's gift, so he devised a very scientific test. He pulled an old group wedding photo that Timmy was a member of and asked Matthew if he recognized him. Up to this point in the episode, the PRS team is doing their initial investigation. They are talking to neighbors and gathering information about the family. If you are paying close enough attention, you can catch little hints of editing magic and leading questions, not to mention the other deceptions that I already pointed out. Remember, they are dealing with this six-year-old boy. In the next scene, Matthew is outside on a swing set with Adam, and Ryan walks up to show him the wedding photo. Instead of showing Matthew several different photos, Ryan primes the boy by saying, one of these people in this photo is your friend Timmy. Matthew points to a man in the picture and says, that one? As if it were a question. Ryan then confirms that he did indeed pick the right man. Listen to the audio carefully, and you can hear how Ryan leads Matthew to the right conclusion. Oh, it's right there. Yeah, this is him. We've borrowed pictures of Timothy in hopes that Matthew can help us determine if the Timmy he is seeing is indeed Timothy Shirey. We're confident that Matthew's never seen a photo of Timothy before. So, if he makes a positive ID, this will be compelling evidence that this boy is truly being visited from the beyond. One of these people is your friend Timmy. One of these people? Yeah. Well, this was taken a long time ago. Okay. That one? You? Yeah. Oh, that one right there. How did you know that's him? It looked like him. With each hour that passes, I think it's more likely that this kid is the real deal. It's really rare for any psychic to be able to see the spirit so clearly that they're able to make a positive ID. This could mean Matthew might be a very powerful clairvoyant. It also means he's going to attract both the good and the bad. And that's a lot for a kid to handle. Maybe Matthew really is psychic. But let's examine the picture. There are 16 people. First, what does Matthew know about Timmy? He knows he is in his late teens or early 20s, and that he is a male. Of those 16 people in the photo, 8 are women, so now we have 8 possible choices. Out of the remaining 8, 
those males over the age of 30 are eliminated, which leaves four possible choices, or a 25% chance of getting it right. We don't know if they edited the sequence of Matthew guessing, but if we listen to how Matthew identifies Timmy, he's not sure which person it is. He points and says, that one? He could have got this on his first try, or his 16th, we just don't know. Is this evidence that he's psychic? I'm not convinced, but Ryan sure is. He must have pretty low standards. Another thing worth mentioning is that Timmy died at the age of 39, but the photo of him was from when he was a teenager. The filming of this episode was done in 2006, and Timmy died in 2002. If he was 19 in that photo, it was taken in 1982. Is Timmy spared a 19-year-old or a 39-year-old? If we believe Matthew, it's the teenage Timmy he saw. Let me get philosophical on you here for a second. When we die, do we get to pick how old we'll be for eternity? If so, I want to be in my mid-20s. Dead time, 3 a.m. This is the anti-hour, widely believed to be the most active time in the spirit world. Even though there's strength in numbers, we've decided to split and do dead time in three teams. Sergi will monitor the equipment including walkie-talkies, surveillance cameras, and motion detectors. My team will be inside the house, and Elfie's team will be outside, at the site of Timmy's death. If you have a question and someone beats you to it, wait at least 15 to 30 seconds before asking your question. Our team has heard enough. They have enough evidence to start the final part of their investigation. With evidence mounting and anxiety levels rising, the team sets up their equipment to prepare for dead time. Keep in mind, all this is taking place within the same day. Dead time is unique to paranormal state, so much so that not even Wikipedia had an entry. Ryan explains that 3 a.m. is dead time, the time spirits and demons are most active. Why, you may ask? Jesus died on the cross at 3 p.m., and 3 a.m. is the anti hour. I see a few problems with this logic. I know, surprising. First, the Bible doesn't say when Jesus died, and I'm pretty sure ancient Israel didn't have a clock to keep track of the hours. If someone has a copy of Jesus' death certificate with the time of death, send it my way, please. Second, do demons and spirits obey international datelines and time zones? Do they even care what time it is to start their haunting? Can they not act before or after 3 a.m. and 4 a.m.? What about daylight savings? Here's my opinion on why they chose this particular time. It's really early in the morning or really late at night, depending on your perspective. They have been traveling for hours and have probably been up more than 12. They are tired and exhausted, and when this happens, your mind can play tricks on you. It can make you think you saw or heard something that's not really there, doubly so if you believe you're going to find something. It looks like they are setting up the most opportune time to have a paranormal experience. The team splits up into two groups with one group outside sitting where Timmy's body was found, and the other group inside the house in the living room. Both groups start asking questions of the spirits when they hear some creaks and groans in what they think is heavy breathing. Go look down the basement steps. Tell me if you see anything. Hold on, don't go down there. Why? I'm not afraid. It's trying to show itself. It may be trying to separate us. It was saying your name. I heard it. Was it Adam? Was it from the basement or just from all around? I don't know, man. But look so down the steps. So if I realized that what was like light falling on something was like a uh, somebody leaning in. It's obviously trying to play games with us. Are they still all the kids? Yeah, should I call them back? Yeah, the town is over. Adam, the psychologist and demonologist, and Ryan hear voices. And Adam says that the voices are telling him to come into the basement, conveniently where Matthew saw Timmy's ghost. Ryan then said he heard a voice call out Adam's name. This is a little strange because I thought the spirit or whatever was after the boy. Why or how does it know Adam and Ryan? the two most knowledgeable people on demons and spirits. The spirits didn't bother the mother or the boy during dead time. Adam never goes into the basement because dead time is over, and we all know that ghosts stop haunting at 4 a.m. The gang gathers back up in the house to review the evidence at 4 or 4 a.m. One thing of note, when they review the audio from the dead time session, they show some video surveillance from the session, and the clock says 11.52 p.m. It's probably an editing mistake more than likely, but it's worth mentioning to point out how these shows are put together in post. Now we need to see if any EVPs were captured by our recording equipment. Yeah, your audio recorder? Yeah. If there is 
there's any evil in this room, I want you to know you will not push my son your way. Our EVPs confirm breathing and other noises during dead time, but we are unable to connect the sounds to any unexplainable source. Some heavy breathing, a few creaks, and a faint voice calling out Adam and Ryan. Nope, no evidence here, folks. Just keep on moving. But the gang can't just leave the family without doing some ritualistic cleansing. A good old Catholic cleansing. At 4.40 a.m., the team walks around the house with a Bible, holy water, crucifixes, and incense. They can finally relax from a hard night's work. But wait. Adam, the psychologist and demonologist, is a little lightheaded after reading the Bible in Matthew's room. Whatever could be the cause of that? But whether there are spirits here or not, we need to perform a house cleansing so that we can give this family some room for peace. They need to feel empowered, and I think that a spiritual cleansing can help start this process. I go room to room and bless each room. In God, I will praise his words. In the Lord, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid, for God is my defense, my God of mercy. Amen. Amen. I'm almost falling over. Something really doesn't want me reading the Bible in here. I told you this is yeah, a very sir, powerful room. I could easily concentrate on the words. This is the house of the Lord. Anything not of the Lord shall leave now and never return. This is also Matthew's room. Lord, we ask you to grant him peace. Lord, bless this house and all who dwell with it. Well, that settles it. That's the end of this podcast. Must have been a demon after all, but I thought it was a spirit of a dead guy. Or could it have been exhaustion or dehydration or both? They have been there all day and night without any rest and probably little to eat. Plus, they are coming off an adrenaline high after the dead time session. Nah, it was probably a demon. Who am I kidding? Hey, how are you? I think you made a world of difference in Matthew. And that's huge, you know? That, that's huge. And you think his behavior looks a little different now? Absolutely. Yes. Really? Mm-hmm. Yes. yes, dramatic. Oh, yeah. He hasn't smiled like that in so long, and it makes you feel so good. Yeah. It's like somebody actually understands him now. Even though we could support him, we didn't have the complete understanding that you guys have, because you guys have been doing it for so long which is what we was looking for, somebody that could make him understand, you know what, I'm not abnormal, and that's what we wanted, and you guys gave that to him, we feel. I think also, when we're not here, you guys have the power to protect him. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Yeah, sure, thank you. After our 24-hour intensive and a few follow-ups, I feel confident in saying that we've helped his family. Matthew is more at ease and is finally sleeping in his own bed again. The family has chosen to accept Matthew's gifts, and that's the best thing they can do for him. No one can stop Matthew from seeing dead people. We can only help him to understand and be there to protect him if we have to. We fast forward two weeks and Ryan and his team revisit the family to check in on Matthew. Another odd editing error here. It appears everyone is wearing the exact same clothes as they did during the sessions two weeks ago. Look, I get it. I could be seen wearing the same shirts or pants over and over again. But what are the odds that everyone, mom, dad, kid, and the whole PRS team are wearing the exact same clothes as they did two weeks ago all at the same time again?
I want to close with a couple of things. First, the actual case and evidence presented. I find it hard to believe the accounts of six-year-olds when it comes to paranormal activity. Children have very hyper-imaginations at that age. I watched my five-year-old daughter play for hours in her own little world using her imagination. It's pretty fascinating. The family appears to be very religious, so they're going to filter everything they experience through that worldview. Crucifixes and Jesus pictures are a pretty good sign that the family is Catholic. So when their six-year-old son says he sees demons and spirits, they're more likely to believe him because they think those things are real. Looking at Matthew in the context of his family, it seems he may be seeking attention. Surprising for a six-year-old. His parents are having marital problems that eventually leads to their divorce. This can spill over to the child. And maybe, just maybe, Matthew saw this as a way of getting attention. Especially if it was encouraged by his parents. If only they interviewed those damn doctors and counselors like I suggested. This is all speculation on my part, but given the evidence, it makes sense. More so than a psychic kid that sees demons and spirits. So what of the actual evidence? Feeling lightheaded after being up for hours, hearing an old house creak, heavy breathing that could have been no way amplified in post-production, calling out names so faintly that you can barely hear, the testimony of a six-year-old boy? Sorry, not convinced. But to be fair, this was their first episode, so maybe the evidence gets better. Second, we are not really formally introduced to the entire team. We meet Ryan and Adam, but hardly a mention of the other members. We don't know who they are or what they've studied or even their role. I covered most of the crew in episode 2 of this podcast, but from watching this episode, we are never officially introduced to the characters. Also, when it comes to paranormal shows, the value is in the production. This episode is filled with intense music and sharp cutaways and somber voiceovers. It does a good job setting the tone for the show, but the editing is a little sloppy. Mistakes such as timestamps, clothing, and misinformation are abundant. They probably expect the average viewer not to notice, but it's pretty obvious once you know what to look for. And luckily for you, dear listeners, I do know what to look for. This has been Paranormal Skeptic Academy. If you like what I do, head on over to patreon.com slash PSA, and for as little as $2 an episode, you can help support my efforts. Each patron will receive the video version of the normal episodes, along with a special RSS feed to add to your favorite podcatcher. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at cweb619. Send me feedback at paranormalskepticacademy at gmail.com. Like the Facebook page, and leave me a review on iTunes and Stitcher. This has been Paranormal Skeptic Academy schooling your favorite ghost hunters.